And the title of the lesson, I think it's in the Facebook uh, live feed, and I think it's in the, I think it's also in the uh, YouTube feed, is something Jesus never heard. Now, I say this, but I don't know for certain that it's true, only in the sense that it's never found in the Bible. All right? And so, according to the Scriptures, according to the Scriptures, I'm going to, I'm going to say, this is something that Jesus never heard. And what is that something that Jesus never heard? Because Jesus heard a lot. He was called the son of the devil. He was called a Samaritan. He was called demon-possessed. Uh, his parentage, and we'll talk a little bit about this, his parentage was, was, uh, was, uh, was slandered. Uh, his own brethren didn't believe in him. He was told he was crazy. I mean, there, there are a lot of, Jesus heard a lot of things. But there's one thing that at least... With regard to the scriptures, there's one thing that Jesus never heard, especially as we speak about the Word of God, and that is this. He never heard this. That's just your opinion. That's just your opinion. I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody say, that's just your opinion. But Jesus never heard it. We've all heard it. Uh, perhaps we've even said it. But in matters pertaining to the Bible, friend, these are dangerous words. And they reveal a very dangerous mindset that truth cannot be known. To, to, say, that, to say that that's just your opinion is to say that absolute objective truth cannot be known. And it's actually an indictment of God that says God cannot give us a book that we're capable of understanding and that, that we can agree on. And so we need to be careful. Now look, I don't think, any, I don't think anybody would say that everybody's ever going to agree on every single thing in the Bible. That would, I think that would be, that would be foolish. There are some things... Uh, that God, there are some things that God leaves intentionally obscure, or uh, not perhaps a, a dearth uh, of, uh, or there's not, not an abundance of information. There's a dearth of information. There are a lot of things uh, that that we might uh, disagree about, but on the things that matter, God God is clear. And uh, and as a general rule, when I hear that's just your opinion, the person that says it to me doesn't have a scripture to support what they say, but they don't like or agree with what I say. And so, you know, if we're going to talk about the Bible, you know, opinions really, really are uh, problematic. You know, what does the Bible say is the, is the only question uh, that needs to be asked, and it's the only question that needs to be answered. Now, if you recall, we may have made mention of this uh, some weeks ago, where Jesus, in, in dealing with... Uh, in dealing with a Jewish lawyer, uh, the, the lawyer asked the Lord, says, I believe this is Mark chapter 12. You have to double check me because I'm running this off the top of my head. But it's about Mark chapter 12, maybe in about verse 32 somewhere, where someone asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And uh, maybe Luke 12, 28. says, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he says, well, what do you read? What do you say? That's what Jesus answered back. He said, he said, well, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What did Jesus say there? In, in, again, Luke 12, 29, Mark 29, somewhere right in there. He says, you have answered rightly. In other words, what you have said is true. Jesus didn't say, well, that's just your opinion, and, 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 and here's what I think. No, he said, you have answered rightly. And so we, we learn just from that statement that there is truth contained in the Scriptures, and that truth can be known, that truth can be understood, and then that truth must be practiced. And so with that in mind, I want us to think about, about three things with regard to the Scriptures and this idea uh, or this statement of, uh, that's just your opinion. Now, the fact that Jesus said, you have answered rightly, shows us there is a proper way to use the Scripture. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, study or be diligent to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling aright or rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, there is a right way to handle the Bible. In Mark, excuse me, Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, in the, the scene or the account known as the temptation of Jesus. In dealing with the devil, the devil quoted the scripture to Jesus. In, in Matthew's account, in the second temptation, he says, If you're the Son of God, cast yourself down. He took him to this holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, said to him, If you're the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. That's Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. The devil quoted the Bible, and he quoted it accurately. But he did not use it right. Because Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 6, 16. It says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, or you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, basically daring God to, to do a thing. And so what Jesus is saying is, you have quoted the scripture, you've quoted it accurately, but you have taken it out of its context and misapplied it. And in fact, in the way that you are applying this text, it contradicts another text. And so there's a proper way to use scripture and there's an improper way uh, to use scripture. Also, our intent uh, is very important as we think about our use of the scripture. If you recall the Sadducees, uh, the Sadducees, you know, they'd seen Jesus rebuke the Pharisees and he had answered all of their issues. So they came up with their, their riddle, their conundrum with regard to the Leverate Law. With a man, in Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10, if a man dies, he doesn't have any children, his brother is to marry the widow and raise up an heir to his brother. And so the Sadducees said, well, here's a man who married and died and he had no children. His brother married and he didn't have any children. And the next brother and the next brother and the next brother and the next brother. Finally, all seven brothers married the same woman. All of them died. And at last the woman died said, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? See, they took the scriptures and they, they built their riddle or their, their conundrum around it with the intent to try to prove Jesus wrong. But what did Jesus say to them? He says... Therefore, you do greatly err, not knowing the Scriptures. Or he says, you do greatly err, not knowing the Scriptures or the power of God. And then at the end he says, therefore, you do greatly err, or you are greatly deceived. And Jesus used the Scriptures, and he used the implication of the Scriptures, and he referenced the power of God, uh, to answer uh, this, this uh, leverate, what we might refer to as the leverate uh, conundrum. And then, for example, also in uh, Matthew 19, verses 3 through 9, as the, as the Jewish leaders approached Jesus on the matter of marriage, and they said, Moses said that a woman, a man can divorce his wife for, for any cause. What, what do you say? And it's generally believed that, that there were two schools of thought on marriage. One uh, was that marriage could only be broken through death or adultery. And then there was another uh, uh, far left idea that a man could divorce his wife for any reason whatsoever. And, uh, and there were these two schools of thought, and it's almost like, well, Jesus, we want to know which rabbi or which teaching you adhere to. But Jesus didn't adhere to any man's teaching. He said, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and two shall be one flesh? Therefore they are no longer two, but one flesh. And what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And so Jesus appealed to the authority of God. And he appealed to the authority of God by using the Scriptures. And so there is, again, there is a proper way to use the Scripture. Uh, then, just as an aside, we've already noted one improper way to use the Scriptures, which is to take it out of its context and to pit it against another Scripture when the two Scriptures need and ought to always be understood uh, in, in complement with one another. But, uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5, um, uh, Paul said, I did not come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. 
God did not use smooth words or, or flattering speech as he talked to, to the Romans. Uh, I believe it was in uh, Romans uh, 16 and uh, verses uh, 17 and following, and also uh, to Timothy, that those who by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Uh, that uh, we shouldn't be playing games with the Word of God, not with man's wisdom. And, uh, you know, some people, I've, I've, in recent weeks, I've been reading uh, Brother Tom Warren's uh, book on uh, lectures on church cooperation and orphan home. And, and he said that and this, this was a series of sermons preached, I believe, in 1958. And uh, the book I uh, have was published in 63. But he was talking about that men were literally opposed to the use of logic in explaining the scriptures. He says, logic is, logic is not a, man, a man-made thing. Logic is given to us by God. God is logical. Christ was logical. And logic has been given to us. And so, and so as, we, as, we think about, as we think about using the scriptures, just because we might use, for example, syllogisms or, or you know, comparisons or, or ways to establish truth, now that's not man's wisdom. That's, that's the wisdom that's been given by God, but if we want to play games with words or, or be dishonest, then that's an improper way uh, to use uh, Scripture. I'll give you an example, and I, I, I think it was probably just an honest mistake, uh, but uh, uh, some months ago I was on a, a, a podcast uh, defending what the Bible says about uh, baptism, and um, the gentleman who spoke the week or two or whatever after me in, in denying baptism, uh, was trying to explain what the word ace means, E-I-S, unto or for. And uh, he quoted a passage that where Jesus told, uh, Jesus told a leper to go and offer a sacrifice for your cleansing. He said, see right there, there's the word for, for your cleansing means, uh, means because of, not unto. Well, the problem was the word ace is not in that verse. It, that's not that's not the word that is there. So I would just assume that was a that was a, just a, a mistake. But just a little bit of research, just a little bit of research, would have would have been helpful uh, there. And so it was a misrepresentation. It was a misrepresentation. And uh, and again, there's what happens when you try to put man's wisdom uh, and man's uh, thinking uh, in various Bible doctrines. Uh, there's a misuse of the scripture from 1 Timothy 6 that supposing that godliness is a means of gain. Uh, you know, people, even at this very hour, are using religion uh, to, uh, to uh, line, their own, line their own pockets and, and fleece uh, multitudes and multitudes of people. You know, when you have televangelists that are worth 10, 20, 30, or 100 million dollars, uh, that's a misuse. That's a misuse of, of religion and is all always accompanied by misuse of Scripture. And then I thought about uh, John, uh, uh, John 7, verse 53 and following, where uh, the woman that was taken in the very act of adultery was brought forth. And, and they said to Jesus, The law says that this person is to be stoned. The problem was their intent and their application were both misguided. Their intent was to try to discredit Jesus, and their application was flawed in the fact that they admitted that the woman was taken in the very act of adultery, but they did not bring the man with her. And so we see that, that, that there's an improper way to use Scripture. So there's a proper way to use Scripture, which also implies there's an improper way. But then secondly, it should be noted that a proper use of Scripture cannot be refuted. A proper use of Scripture cannot be refuted. In other words, when, when the Scripture is used and it's used properly, there's no answer to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, people can disregard it. You know, in Jeremiah 36, Jeremiah had sent a word, uh, uh, sent a word to Jehoiakim, and uh, Jehoiakim took the Word of God, and it, was, it says pen knife, but we'd call it a pocket knife, took his pocket knife out, cut the Word of God all to pieces, and pitched it in the fire, as if somehow by, by burning up the Word of God, the Word of God didn't, didn't exist anymore. And then uh, 
Baruch went back to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah said, write all the words that, that I just gave you, and I'm going to add some more to it. And so a proper use of Scripture cannot be refuted. Uh, it can be disregarded. Uh, people can divert attention away from it. In other words, you know, don't, don't look over here, look, look, look over there. Uh, you know, Peter tried to divert uh, the Lord's attention uh, from himself over to John when, when things got pretty hot there in John 21, 15. You know, when Jesus was really putting, shining the spotlight on Peter, and Peter didn't like it, he started sweating. And he says, well, Lord, what about this man over here? In other words, leave me alone for a little while and, and deal with this guy. Well, Jesus said, if he lives till I comes again, what's that to you? In other words, don't, don't try to be pointing my attention or somebody's attention somewhere else. If it's true, it's true and you need to deal with it. Uh, a proper use of Scripture can't be refuted, but it might, uh, it might result in, in some type of rebellion or, or even some type of personal attack. Or maybe it could result in a physical attack. You remember the Apostle Paul and the Apostles were all physically attacked at various times. Uh, that's not so much a danger where we live here in America, uh, although I do know uh, faithful Christians that were, that were stoned uh, by the Muslims uh, for preaching the gospel in public in Ghana back in the early and mid-60s, and I know that that kind of stuff still goes on in many places around the world. Uh, but most of the attacks, for example, that, that we might hear or, or think about today are basically ad hominem attacks. In other words, uh, I'm going to attack, the, not physically attack the person, but I'm going to verbally attack the person. I'm going to verbally impugn the individual because I can't deal with the individual's arguments, so therefore I'm going to try to discredit the individual. I'll give you an example of this. Years ago when uh, Bill Maher, and I'm not, I'm not a fan of Bill Maher, but he f came out with a program years ago called Politically Incorrect. And it was supposed to be it was supposed to be two people from each side of the political spectrum, and they were just free to say whatever they wanted to say. And and uh, one time there was a, a a a program one of the programs, and Ben Stein was on there representing a conservative viewpoint, and it was basically three against one, four against one if you if you uh, if you uh, you figure in uh, uh, Mar. And uh, and the funny thing was, here's some knucklehead actress who doesn't know anything and she's going to refute a guy to, as brilliant as Ben Stein and they were talking about population you know what about a population explosion and Stein's like here's the facts the world can hold at least nine billion people and at that time the population wasn't even seven billion and they just all clutched their pearls and oh nine billion people will all starve to death and and they just kept throwing accusation after accusation and Stein just kept just kept spitting out the facts. Here's the facts. Here's the facts. Here's the facts. And here's what one woman finally said. Why should we believe anything you say? You worked as a speechwriter for Richard Nixon. What was he trying to do? He's trying to discredit him because he was in some way related, had a relationship to a discredited president. But it didn't answer one thing about the facts that he had talked about. And he said, he goes, what is this? He said, you've resorted to an ad hominem argument because I work for Nixon. You, know, you can't answer my arguments, so now you're just going to attack, you're going to attack my integrity or you're going to attack me personally. Well, that, that's what oftentimes happens. When you, start, when you start speaking truth and people can't answer that truth, they'll start attacking you verbally and saying things about you uh, uh, in public in, in an attempt to try to discredit you. Why do they do that? Because they can't answer the arguments. And by the way, that's happened to me recently. Happened to me recently. The arguments can't be answered, so we're going to try to attack the person's uh, integrity. Uh, and by the way, this is nothing new. It happened in the days of the Bible. In John 15, excuse me, John 7 and verse 15, they attacked Jesus' uh, scholarship. How does this man know the law having never studied? In other words, he didn't go to school. What does he know? Well, apparently he knew quite a bit. And, uh, you know, a lot of the best preachers that I've ever uh, known and heard are, are guys that, that really don't have a whole lot of formal, formal training. They're just old plowboy preachers. You know, guys that, that, that get into the Word and, and, and they dig and they study and they work hard and, and, and they hone their skills. And, and, and they're great 
faithful, able preachers of the gospel. And I've seen other guys that's got more degrees than, than a thermometer that couldn't reason their way out of a wet paper sack and, and, and couldn't preach, you know, couldn't preach their way out of, uh, out of a three-inch hole. Uh, and so, you know, this idea that, well, if you didn't go to school, you don't have a degree, this or that, you can't be as good or smart or whatever as somebody else, so we're going to question your scholarship. Well, that still doesn't, that still doesn't answer the argument. They couldn't answer Jesus' arguments, so they questioned his schooling. Uh, sometimes they even questioned uh, his sanity. You know, and, uh, they, even his own family said, oh, he's out of his mind. You know, the, the house was full of people and, and they couldn't get to Jesus. And, and they said, he's out of his mind. They questioned uh, his sanity. Uh, some even in John 8 said, said he was demon possessed. Or they questioned his parentage. We were not born of fornication, John 8 and, uh, and verse uh, 41 and following. In other words, we can't answer your argument, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll remind everybody about the suspicious circumstances of your conception and your birth. And so we'll discredit you, uh, we'll discredit you that way. Or they might, uh, they, you know, they just tried to discredit Paul in Acts 17 on Mars Hill. They said, what is this babbler talking about? Acts 17, verse 8. What is this babbler talking about? He was talking about the resurrection. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in soul and spirit and those types of things. So he's a, he's a babbler. And by the way, that wasn't the only time that happened to Paul. Acts 24, 26. What, what did the man say? Paul, much learning has made you crazy. He said, I'm not crazy. He said, I, I, said, I got all my mental faculties. And so, but uh, people can just try to discredit us personally uh, uh, when they cannot answer the argument. But here's, 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 the, the, here's the proper response. When, when somebody gives biblical truth and I can't answer it and I don't believe it, here, here's, here's the only appropriate response. If you're not going to believe it, then here's the appropriate response. Be quiet. Be quiet. What do we find in Matthew 21, Matthew 22? The Pharisees, they attack Jesus, they attack Jesus, they attack Jesus. And he answered them. And you know what it says? It says, he put the Pharisees to silence. So then the Sadducees decided they'd try their luck at it. They're in Matthew 22 and beginning in verse 32, again with that levirate conundrum. And he answered that one. And you know what it says after that? No one dared ask him any more questions. When somebody drops Bible truth on you, if you're not going to believe it, at least have enough integrity to be quiet. You know, the devil couldn't answer Jesus. When Jesus answered the devil in Matthew 4 three times, it is written, it is written, it is written. The devil didn't say, well, that's just your opinion. At least the devil had enough integrity to turn tail if he wasn't going to believe it, he just turned tail and went the other way. And don't say this. Well, we'll just agree to disagree. No, we won't. <clears throat> See, when we're studying the Bible, and I open up this book, and I start showing you in this book what this book says, what God says in this book, just because you, don't, just because you refuse to believe it doesn't mean we're going to agree to disagree. Yeah. And when I give you this book and you don't give me any defense, any attempt, when you don't make any scriptural attempt to defend what you say, just be quiet. Don't say we're going to agree to disagree because we're not going to. We'll disagree, but we're not going to agree to disagree. Yeah. If I'm telling you what the Bible says, at least have enough integrity to open up your Bible and show me where I'm wrong. You know, if I, if I teach something and you don't believe it, open up your Bible, give me a call, shoot me a text, throw me a, a messenger, uh, a text on messenger, and I promise you, I'll open up this book with you and we'll study as long as it takes. But we're not going to agree to disagree. We might disagree, but we're not going to agree to disagree because this book teaches truth. This book teaches truth truth and so don't 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 bring me we're just going to agree to disagree bring me your bible bring me the scriptures it might be that i'm wrong and if i'm wrong i promise you i'll change because i don't want to do anything more 
I don't want to do, there's nothing I want more than to believe truth and practice and practice the truth, no matter what personal cost it might be uh, to me. So you'd be, you'd be my friend if you'll, bring me, if you'll bring me some Bible and we can study together. And then lastly is this. A proper use of Scripture reveals the genuineness of a man's heart. You know, in Hebrews chapter 4 and in verse number 12, it says, The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of a man's heart. What discerns a man's heart? Word of God. What discerns uh, 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 the thoughts and the intents of a man's heart? Not me. The Word of God does it. So how does the Word of God do it? Well, one way, if I teach something and somebody says, well, I just don't believe that. I just don't believe that. Okay, well, show me in the Bible what you do believe, and we'll see if what you, what you believe is in accordance with the Scriptures, because I'm going to tell you what I believe, and I'm going to show you the Scriptures. That's not what I believe. Well, if it's what the Bible says, you better believe. And not only you better believe it, you better do what it says. And so, so I doubt, well, that's not what I believe. Well, the Word of God's just the Word of God's just discerned the thoughts and the intent of your heart or well that just doesn't make sense to me i don't understand why you have to be baptized doesn't matter if it makes sense to you you know it probably didn't make sense to, to moses to hit a rock with a stick make water come out of it but that's what he did Probably didn't make sense to Moses to, to make a, a snake out of brass and towed it around the, the campsite to heal it so that people could see it and come to it and look at it and be healed of a snake bite. What, you know, what, kind of sense, what kind of sense does that make? Probably didn't make a whole lot of sense for Israel to march around Jericho for seven days. You know, well, what if they say, well, Lord, that just doesn't make sense to me to walk around this thing for seven days. Doesn't matter if it makes sense to you. It's what, it's what God said. You know, it didn't make any sense to Naaman when the man of God said, go dip seven times in the Jordan River and you'll be cleansed. Didn't make sense to him. And when he went away, and he went away mad, he went away and he was still a leper. But when his, when his people pleaded with him to go and do what the man of God said, he did what the man of God said, and he got exactly what he came for. He got, he got his, his skin uh, restored, his, his health was returned to him. And so, you know, it doesn't make sense to me is not a is not an appropriate response to you know, now now if I don't now listen, I don't understand is a different thing altogether. I don't understand is a different thing than it doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand says I need a little more information. I want to get this right in my head. It doesn't make sense to me is I don't believe this and because I don't believe it I'm not going to do it. And then Here's, here's, the ultimate, here's the ultimate revealer. Here's the ultimate revealer. I know it says that, but... I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. I know or I see, I read that it says that, but the Word of God's just revealed the thoughts and intents of your heart. I didn't do it. Whoever's trying to teach it didn't do it. The Word of God did it. And so as we think about the, the need for diligent, uh, sound, faithful study of the Word of God, just remember, it can't be refuted. It may, it may well be rejected and, and result in, in some type of, of personal, uh, personal attack. But ultimately, the teaching of the Word of God is going to reveal, is going to reveal the thoughts and the intents of your heart. And so we encourage you. Uh, we encourage you to study the Word of God, and we'll study with you to whatever uh, uh, end uh, is desired. Uh, we welcome we welcome questions, uh, and, and we welcome the opportunity to, to open up the Word of God and study uh, with any one of you uh, to your heart's desire. All right, that's going to finish us up for today. We want to thank you for uh, being with us and being a part of uh, the uh, Bible study and our worship assembly today.
If the Lord wills, at 5.30, we'll be back with uh, live questions and answers. Uh, we'll deal with the what is the work of the Holy Spirit. We didn't get to that last week. And then our second question uh, deals with the, the supposed genocide of, uh, of the Canaanite, basically of the Canaanite peoples uh, in the Old Testament uh, when uh, God's children came out of Egypt, out of the wilderness, and into the Promised Land. We'll talk about uh, some things pertaining to um, the so-called extermination of the Canaanites. And so that's where we'll start. And I already have another question beyond that one, but I won't introduce it uh, unless we have time tonight. But at 5.30, uh, 5.30 this afternoon, our time here in Central, uh, Central Time Zone, uh, we'll be back, and we hope that you will join us then. Let's close our uh, period this morning with a word of prayer, and then we'll be done. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for the opportunity we had to be here. We're thankful for the chance that we have to study your word, Father, to open it up and, and let you speak to us through this word. Father, may our, our, the ears and eyes of our hearts be open uh, to the things that your word has for us. And Father, may our hearts be softened to receive them. And may we uh, take in your word as seed. And may that seed find place deep in our hearts and root deep in our hearts that we might uh, uh, produce not only the plant, but the fruit uh, that your word produces uh, in the lives of good and honest folks. Father, go with us uh, through the further exercise of our time, uh, our, our afternoon. Father, if it be your will, bring us back together at 530 this afternoon in Jesus' name. Amen.